So we are back um, for another episode of An Incomplete History. This uh, this week we're going to be talking about Margaret Sanger and eugenics, kind of broadly speaking. We got prompted to last week when we were talking about second wave feminism. We end up like going back and back and back. And so I think for this week, it's a kind of a nice, we had a little bit of a nice bridge, even though we're going back in history we definitely had a setup. So if you didn't listen to last week's episode, you might want to listen to that first. Yeah. So last week's second wave feminism. I mean, I've gotten a lot of comments, people asking um, why we left certain things out. Um, You know, it's only an hour long podcast. (laughs) There's just not every, we can't discuss every facet of second wave feminism and that's not even to get into kind of third and fourth wave feminism um but uh this week we're going to kind of try to deep dive on margaret sanger and this idea of eugenics um i think we're gonna purposefully privilege california in this right i think we both have an argument about california's status in the uh the formulation of eugenics it's not a good thing it's not a good thing. Um, yeah, California is undoubtedly number one. Um, this isn't a good thing to be number one in. But uh, yeah, it should be an interesting episode. Um, so let's get started. Welcome to An Incomplete History. I'm Hillary. And I'm Jeff. And we're your hosts for this weekly history podcast. So Hillary and I can now see each other while we podcast, which is interesting. But it's I noticed delightful. The, the first Although thing I, I can't noticed dance to the intro music anymore without being like slightly embarrassed. <laughs> the uh I mean the interesting thing is this morning or this afternoon, we're recording in the afternoon, I saw her and she's like all bundling up in a blanket or a is that a snuggie? No, it's just a big fluffy blanket. Oh, it's a shame it's not a snuggie. Um, I'm a bit get, like, like Linus corporate sponsorship from snuggy or something yeah, um looking. but it's but it was interesting and uh, so tell us like how's your how's your warm spring going there in oxford mississippi well i have such a weather report for you today yesterday this was national news there were long track tornadoes going through all of the south uh, mississippi included we had insane thunderstorms there was like lightning, thunder, lightning, thunder. I mean, it was just like nonstop. And then we kept getting tornado warnings. And so we were under tornado warning yesterday from seven in the morning until midnight the following morning. So we were like all day getting prepared to go run into the closet with the cats. It was 85 degrees yesterday. 85. Now today I wake up, I go out for my morning walk in like you know, short sleeves and I walk outside, it was 40 degrees in one day. And so I'm freezing now. The house is freezing. I just, I just can't get used to the, like, it's not the bad weather necessarily. It's the shifts, the rapid shifts between hot and cold and hot and cold. It's too hard for me to adjust. You just grew up unaccustomed to seasons. But is it really a season? I mean, I feel like the yeah. seasons are like they come and they stay and it's consistent. Like but you're I don't mind cusp, consistently right? cold. I mean, technically it's not spring yet. That's true. So I guess I yesterday was just kind of a weird day because it was hot. I remember my last my last winter in New York City before I moved out west. I remember there was a late April day and it was so cold and then it snowed. And I was like, this is why I'm leaving you. Can't handle it. I'm like, I can't. Well, we have gorgeous weather here today. The rain has stopped. It's slowly but surely warming up to where it should be this time of year. Next week, we have a little break from school and it's supposed to be actually right about where it should be. Um, You guys are no longer on purple tier lockdown, right? You're on red now. 
We are on red. Um, I'm watching Harvey do something he shouldn't be doing. He's anyway. Um, yeah, we're on red. Uh, what does that mean? Who knows? Um, I'm not going to go out and do stuff till I get my second shot and wait two weeks. And even then I'm not going to go out and do much until, uh, Fauci tells us Papa Fauci Papa, when he tells us it's okay. I mean, I will defer to his medical expertise. Nobody in Mississippi is doing that because um, if you go to the store now, nobody has a mask on. Uh, there's no limits on how many people can come into the store. Everything's open just pr- like as if there's no pandemic happening. And uh, it's really disappointing. So we've really locked down even more. We just go to the store and I don't so know. So let me ask horrible. you this. Do you think the the state, the government, and by the state, when historians, we say the state, we mean the government. We don't mean like the state, like California, Mississippi, the state. Do you think the state has a responsibility to protect people from themselves? Huh. This is and a I know you know where I'm going. <laughs> I mean, do you, in the, in the era of COVID-19, do you think the state has a responsibility to protect people from their own behavior? No, I don't think they should be protecting them from their own behavior. I think they should be protecting citizens at large and other people. And so then that does mean that you regulate individual behavior to help keep other people safe. So for example, like there's a speed limit and the speed limit, it's not necessarily to be like, oh, you have to drive slow and for your own safety. I mean, it's a little bit for you, but it's mostly like, you're not going to go out and endanger everybody else around you who's driving at a normal speed. So that's how I kind of feel with pandemic stuff. It's like, it's not for you. It's for everybody else. Do you know speed limits were not initially put in place for safety? Uh, well, it was, it was the gas crisis. Something to do, huh? It was the gas crisis, the energy mm-hmm. crisis in the early 1970s, because they found you could get much higher efficiency out of combustion engines at lower speeds. Well, and they weren't cars didn't go super super fast back then either, right? Like. Um, I don't know. Have you ever been like some of the muscle cars that they've like rebranded? Well, yeah, but they, re- they, they, they like mess with those. Like my dad has a bunch of muscle cars and he messes with those to make them go super fast. But like when they were like stock engines, were they going, you know, like a Tesla I, or something? I mean, uh, oh yeah, much faster than a Tesla. I remember my dad had this green much Pontiac. Much faster than a Tesla? They yeah. go so fast. My dad, had, my dad had this green Pontiac and it was a beast. First of all, the thing was about 200 feet long. Um, it, it was just gigantic. It took a while for that team to build up speed. But once it built up speed, man, inertia just took over. It was just like a rocket. Um, but but I, I, I think that it's interesting. COVID-19, seatbelts, speed limits. I think they're all interesting examples of places people – are a little more willing to let the government step in and intervene in people's lives. Birth control and women's reproductive rights has been a place where there's been a lot of, it's, it's very contentious place, right? A woman's, a woman's reproductive system is, I would say ground zero for the culture wars. Oh yeah. Yeah. And has been for a very long time. And so eugenics, so eugenics is not really a word until the end of the 19th century. And when we say 19th century, we mean the 1800s. Oh, yes. <laughs> Just to clarify, the 1800s are the 19th century. The 1900s are the 20th century. And we are now currently in the 21st century. We are century. in the 21st century because we're above the number 2000. Yes, thank you. I've had several issues with that this week, um, but I won't go into any further detail. I always have students get confused about it. They were yeah, like, I have students get confused, which about? is fine, but not when they write me snarky emails telling me that I've made a terrible error yeah. because I don't know what I'm talking about. Then I don't like it. Um, but so the the word eugenics applies to this pseudoscience that develops in the late 19th century. Well, let's not jump to pseudoscience. Let's 
Let's okay. Well, but it's take it on its own lines. grounds. Let's take it on its own grounds. Initially, then okay. we'll dismantle it. Okay. 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 <laughs> Hillary's been chomping at the bit to like talk about this for some time, and and it's disturbing. But it is not. It is widely accepted. So what is it? Yeah. So, well, it depends on where you're at. So when it emerges first in the late 19th century in Great Britain, the idea is that we can control, as a society, we can control our populations through good breeding, through genetic selection. Um, And in the British sense of the word eugenics, it was like, we need to make sure that people of the upper classes are reproducing at a greater rate than those of the lower classes, because there was this idea that people who had more wealth had more intelligence. And there was a push toward making sure that there were more intelligent people who were going to flourish and make the country better. So the idea is like, okay, we can control the populations. um, I don't know, they would say like fitness by having good breeding standards, almost as if you were talking about livestock. So this is Sir Francis Galton. Yes. Who is a relative of who? Uh, Charles Darwin. Well, I know he reads, I didn't realize they were related. I know he reads, he reads Origin of the Species and it changes his life. This is, Origin of the Species is an amazing work in and of itself, but it's even more amazing on how it sparks all these people to do these things. And many of the things people do are disturbing. So you have uh, social Darwinism gets invented out of this, um, which is kind of a misapplication of Darwin, Darwin's ideas back onto the way society functions. Harvey is in agreement with me completely. But then you have Galton, and he he looks at kind of nature and how it's functioning in Darwin's work, and he starts to apply it to people. And he actually uses this word eugenics. And eugenics, when he first uses it, does not have a nefarious meaning. It's like improvement of genes, best genes, good genes. Yeah, so EU is the re- root word for good. It's a Greek root, right? You have words that are like euphemism or something, right? So yeah, it's it's not a bad word. It does. It means basically good breeding or good life, right? But it but it comes out of a another idea, one that one of I know Hillary and I's favorite people, favorite presidents, he subscribes to this, uh, race suicide. There's a fear that white people are not white Anglo Saxon people are not reproducing at a rate that they should be to remain dominant in society and that other people, other groups are reproducing at a much higher rate. And I think this is the core. I mean, this kind of race suicide and Teddy Roosevelt believed in race suicide. He thought it was a thing. They, he warned about it. A lot of people, William Jennings Bryant warned about race suicide. Anytime you see kind of a, a uh, white person warning of watering down the gene pool or weak blood or something in the 19th and early 20th century, it's race suicide is what they're talking about. So the idea, though, too, is not just race suicide, but is almost like being outpaced by non-white people or by immigrants. And we've talked a bunch about like whiteness and what it means on here. And like the definition of what being white is shifts so dramatically over time. And it's a totally socially constructed concept. But in the late 19th and early 20th century, it wasn't just an idea that like white people weren't reproducing enough, but the idea was that immigrants and black people were reproducing too much. And in the United States, this takes, so we talked about how it takes root in Great Britain is the idea that like we need to have good genes and like make sure that people are breeding well. And I think about it so much like in terms of the way that we select dogs from breeders or something like that, right? Like who were the parents and are they AKC and stuff? That's the way they were talking about it in Britain. 
when it takes root in the United States in the early 20th century, it's a very different discussion. And the discussion is not how do we breed better people? How do we stop undesirable people from breeding? Breeding. Reproducing. There's an amazing consensus about who undesirables are at this point, too. Like, that's the thing I find. And I mean, early 20th century, when they start to kind of come up with these ideas, I am shocked by how on board everybody seems to believe that this is a good idea. So who do they target? Who are the who are the first targets? Well, for eugenics? it's people who are mentally unfit is what they, so they call them imbecile imbeciles. Yes. And so it, we don't them. like using these terms, but they do use them in this very like professional sense. We'll say imbeciles or morons. And they would uh, rank people too. They had like a yes. scale. Yeah. So the first people that are targeted are people who are considered mentally disabled. And they're targeted for sterilization. One thing forced, that I don't think we talked about. sterilization. What was that? Forced, yeah. Forced. Forced sterilization, yes. And I don't think we talk about that enough. It ends up being that 32 states in the United States pass sterilization laws that make it permissible to sterilize, forcibly sterilize without the permission of the person at all or consent or anything or sometimes even knowledge mm -hmm. that you can just take somebody in and sterilize them. And this is like a major procedure for a woman. And it was happening to, you know, anyone that the state, getting back to that term that we use, deemed unfit to reproduce. And this happens well into the 20th century. So, and some people even argue that it's happening today. I mean, I just read an article the other day about how ICE in the detention facilities is uh, forcibly giving forced hysterectomies to detainees. And we can talk about that later, but it happens really um, openly, right? So as eugenics becomes Americanized, um, I think one of the things is there's an idea to remove the ability of people who are seen as burdens on society. And there's an idea to remove their ability to, to reproduce. Therefore you won't compound their burden on society with even more. And we'll, we'll talk about a couple of famous cases I'm sure later, but I am struck by this while I was kind of reading to get ready for today's episode my mother, when she had my youngest brother, and she was over 40 at that point, or she may have been 40, um, they gave her, um, you know, an amniocentesis test. And it was to test for Down syndrome. Why do you think that test was given? They do it now. I mean, they still do it. I know, to but, this day. but I mean, that's early. the thing is. Uh -huh. Why is that test given? It's yeah. so that you can make an informed decision of whether or not to carry the pregnancy through to term. When you're encouraged not to. That is eugenics. That is eugenics. 100%. That is that's definitionally eugenics. eugenics right there. Yes. You are making a decision that a person based on a certain set of criteria is not, will be too much of a burden on society. I, <laughs> just like... It's let's very uncomfortable Mar when you think about it, it, right? It is. Well, let's talk about Margaret Sanger then. Let's bring her in and we can kind of weave these two threads together because, oh, Maggie, she is really seen as a heroine in the women's movement. I mean, she is credited with founding uh, the first birth control cl clinic in the United States, and it eventually becomes Planned Parenthood. Yeah, and she has a really interesting origin story, I think. Um, she was born to um, a very large Irish family, right? She's one of 11 children. Her mother had had 11 children plus seven miscarriages. Her mother had been pregnant 18 times. 
She ends up dying at a very young age at 50. She's 50 years old and had been pregnant 18 times. That's just like mind blowing to me. And it is said that she stood over her mother's coffin at the funeral and screamed at her dad and said, this is your fault. Mom died because of you. And she has this very firsthand trauma and experience of watching her mother kind of haplessly go through life, getting pregnant again and again and again with absolutely no means of control over her own reproductive life. And so she goes into, you know, she, I would, I don't want to say she goes into the movement, like she kind of spawns this movement to help women who are married. I think that's her, I mean, underlying, right? Like the, the very first. Initially. Yeah. Initially. I think that's, this is, I mean, and this is what's so complicated about her. I think she starts out at a very good place. She wants to give married women the ability to choose when to have children and when not to have children. And she is not talking about abortion. Let's make this perfectly clear. Margaret Sanger, even though she's connected with Planned Parenthood, she is very opposed to abortion in all but a very limited number of cases. Well, and she's talking about women gaining some control over their reproductive health. Because I'd like to point out that marital rape isn't a thing. There's no such thing as a, a husband raping his wife. Legally, legally. Legally. It is not. It's No judge would hear a case about marital rape at this time. And right. we're talking about the, the 19 teens and early 1920s at this point. So a woman who is married is at her husband's whim, basically, as a sexual plaything. Um, and she doesn't get to say, no, I don't want to, or no, it's not a good time for me. Um, I have a headache, whatever. She's not really allowed to say that any woman at this time. And so women end up getting pregnant again and again and again and again. A lot of this also has to do with a lack of education, not truly understanding like how and when and what happens. I mean, I'm not trying to say everybody's ignorant, but there isn't a widespread education about sexual reproductive health. And so Margaret Sanger says, I want to help disseminate literature on this. I want to have a clinic to help women understand their own reproductive cycle. And I want to be able to produce or provide birth control methods to women who want to be able to limit the number of children that they have. Why is that a problem in 1920? What's the law at that time? About? The Comstock laws. Oh, so the Comstock laws have to deal with using the Postal Service to deliver obscene material. And And, and birth control information is considered obscene. I mean, this is so much falls under the rubric of the Comstock law. Allen Ginsberg's poem, Howl, is prosecuted under the Comstock law. I mean, many of these things are done, but it's birth control. Later, when um, for uh, LGBT Pride Month, we might talk about kind of how the Comstock law figures into preventing the transmission of information about that movement as well. But this is the easiest, fastest way for them to do this. And it's it's an interesting thing because women are prohibited from talking about this. And they're prohibited from talking about each other about it as well in any kind of organized fashion. So she, you know, she ends up with this magazine, The Birth Control Review. Even the name itself was enough to violate the Comstock law. Right. Birth control review. How how dare you? Why are you talking about this? What I find interesting, though, about the Comstock laws is it's initially, I think it's 1874 that they come about. And it's like to stop pornography from circulating through the mail. And I find Anthony Comstock to be just like the world's biggest pervert because he's just like, bring me all the pornography. Nobody can see it, right? <laughs> like, it's yeah. very strange. Um, but then it ends up being that so many things fall under the purview of these laws that aren't abolished into well into the 20th century. And birth control becomes, you know, 
sending anything through the mail that has to do with reproductive health becomes illegal. Even doctors sending pamphlets about hygiene, um, anything, it becomes illegal for that to happen. And I remember being in the archives very, very early in my career and finding a lot of pamphlets from this era from the YMCA and the YWCA. And so you could go to those organizations and they could give you pamphlets on health, but they could not mail those. And Margaret Singer couldn't mail. So she has one clinic in Harlem where people can, women can go to seek information or seek help. But she is unable really to like spread this message of like, hey, there are ways that you can control the number of children you have. Where she falls into the big problem. I mean, we talk about eugenics, like well, how is she let's, related? Well, let's Sorry. before we get to the bad, let's let's talk about the good as well. She also advocates that if a woman does this, sexual intercourse will be more pleasurable for the woman. And this is revolutionary to say at this time, too. It's like, wait, sex should be enjoyable for the woman? What? Yeah. Honestly, I think this is what Comstock. So the reason Comstock finds out she's doing this is this is her estranged husband reports her. Yeah, there's a lot of like um I think drama around her and her estranged husband and her divorce and like someone she was having an affair with who was also married and then she hates her. Was it Emma was it Emma Goldman? Uh-huh. I think it was Emma Goldman. Yeah. So there's a lot of drama about Maggie. But no, maybe I shouldn't call her Maggie. Well, so she she opens this clinic and she immediately seems to pivot to really wanting to proselytize birth control amongst the black community. And what I find really surprising is she gets some support from some people that actually should not surprise us if we've read what they've written. W.E.B. Du Bois is a big supporter of hers. And remember, W.E.B. Du Bois talks about the talented 10th. Basically, the idea that all of the resources of the African-American community should be born, could should be put into its top 10% to make them as successful as possible. And that 10% will kind of be able to pull the rest with them. Um, Sanger looks at the black community in New York and Harlem particularly. And she says, the problem is you're having too many babies. Too many babies without enough resources. Yeah. And it's interesting because she like explicitly prohibits any kind of racist talk at her clinic. Like if you're going to work with her, you have to be willing to work with black patients and black clients. So she doesn't tolerate any of that. At the same time, and this is, I think, where Angela Davis, so Angela Davis, we talked about her last week, is a real critic of what Margaret Sanger is doing here. Because I think Sanger's racism is very well concealed, I think. I think it flows in the moment of time in which she lives to be very under wraps because you mentioned this. So we're in the era of like heavy segregation and it's not just segregation in the South. I mean, there's segregation that happens across the United States and for her to have a clinic that serves black Americans just the same way as it serves white Americans um, is, is kind of rebellious and in and of its own right. But her racism, which I think there's a lot of fair, 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 critique of it sort of flies under the radar in the 1920s and she, she I think, lectures she lectures to a group of women the women's auxiliary of the ku klux klan in new jersey yes yes she does yeah and, I, and i'm not i don't think i don't think that's great right but the fact that she is serving members of all different communities i think for that time period people would look at that and go wow what is she doing, right? But when we look back and we see the intention behind it, right? That's where the problem comes in. It's like the intention behind uh, serving those groups had nothing to do with helping them as much as it had to do with limiting their reproductive capacity. And then you go, oh my gosh. It's, it's jarring when you think about it in that context. And you can see why 
even up until this day, there is a huge distrust of institutions like Planned Parenthood. Because it's like, what is your motive? Like, what is your motive here? What are you trying to do? And it becomes troubling, right? To, when you think about the history of it and like trying to stop certain people from reproducing, it's kind of scary. Well, she's not opening a clinic in like well-to-do white Anglo-Saxon neighborhoods and proselytizing to them. No. I mean, so she actually, she has so many people who are in support of her project. John D. Rockefeller Jr. Um, If you ever watched anything on uh, PBS, it's funded by a generous grant from the John D. Rockefeller Foundation. So many generous grants. And this is the thing. Rockefeller gives her money, but does it anonymously. And that right there should tell you there's something a little sketchy going on. Uh, Pearl Buck, she works with Pearl Buck to establish a clinic in Shanghai. I mean, it's... it. I'm very torn by this because on one side, I, I like that she's putting the power to control reproduction into the hands of women and that they can make informed decisions about when to have children. At the same time, she seems to be targeting certain communities with this message. Well, she is targeting certain communities with the message, yeah. And her argument, and it's the same with W.E.B. Du Bois, because they write to each other, um, and he has a lot of different writings about birth control and such. The argument is, if poor people stop having so many children, and this this goes across race, um, In in his case, he's talking about black Americans, but in her case, she's talking about immigrants too. Um, But they're talking about class at this point. If poor people stop having so many children, they can have, they can live better lives. If they, if they're not so economically hampered by raising so many kids. I hear people say that to this day. I hear people say that all the time. It's like this generally accepted thing. They're, to me, the issue with childbearing at this moment, it's so related, is that you have to be economically fit in order to have children. There are so many economic barriers to having children that if you try to have them and you don't you don't have the money, basically, you're going to have a real hard time with it. And the economic barriers are completely socially constructed. There's no mm-hmm. reason why formula has to cost as much as it does. Right? It, there's this well, economic I mean, barrier. I mean, that's a whole other thing, right? When I the, think it's when really the, connected, though. I, I when think the medical really and the chemical kind of petrochemical foundations and, and food producers kind of conspire to convince people that breastfeeding is not actually good for children, that, that formula oh, is right. Like, okay, well, I should have said like diapers or something. I should, uh, yeah. What I'm saying is like the equipment to have a baby costs. Is it a million so dollars? Isn't it like a million dollars or something? By the time the baby's raised? Mm-hmm. I think something like that. It's crazy. It's a crazy it's amount. It's a of crazy money. amount of money in the United States. Um but let's I mean let's let's move to California specifically now. We said we were going to pick on California. So I'm going to make an assertion, and I know you agree with it because we've talked about this before. California. Uh, so the things the Nazis do in Germany with eugenics in the 1930s are learned almost wholly from the state of California's experience in the 1920s. And Hitler says it. Hitler explicitly says it. Yes. Right? So California has these big state hospitals. And this becomes the venue for carrying out this very aggressive form of eugenics. And the thing is, I think what Sanger's doing in Harlem, there's a plausible deniability about the racism. Right? So, oh, no, this isn't racist. California, they are specifically targeting Mexican-American women, African-American women, as well as anybody they identify as having a physical disability or a mental condition. Um, All of these things being pretty subjective. 
Right. Right. And there's, I mean, that's, that's a whole other thing. There's a great book by the late Peggy Pasco uh, called doing what comes naturally. And it's about miscegenation. There's this fantastic case that happens in San Diego about the same time where this court is trying to decide on the race of this woman. And the woman will not say a thing. And they bring these experts in and the like, phrenology rears its ugly head. See Harley Harvey hates phrenology. So well they at this time, I mean, what's connected to eugenics too is like measuring people's head, measuring people's bodies, um, giving mental fitness tests, right? Like IQ tests sort of things. I mean, they put people through several different tests that they kind of purport as being these objective measures of mental or physical health, but they end up putting these barriers in front of people that are, that are really subjective at the end of the day. And so you have these hospitals that, um, you know, are supposed to be figuring things out about people. And that case that you're talking about in San Diego, it's like, she's just sitting there. It's like, there's no way really to determine what race somebody is just by looking at them, really. I mean, and so that's a really interesting case of like, this is just a completely socially constructed phenomenon. And, you know, as a part of the eugenics movement to try to say like, no, there are objective measures where we can decide somebody's fitness mentally or physically. And then if you don't pass that test, you're forcibly sterilized. It's so terrifying. And California definitely leads the way And again, Hitler says, this is where we got our idea from, because we know during the Holocaust, there's predominantly people of Jewish descent who are um, mass executed, but it's also people who are disabled. It's also people who are mentally and physically disabled and people who are homosexual. And the Roma. What was that? And the Roma. The Roma. Right. 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 I mean, they're they're targeting groups of people who they view as drags on society. Um, so California passes this eugenics law, and they basically let institutions, state institutions, sterilize people deemed as unfit. And there's no definition of what that means. And I want to talk about Dr. Leo Stanley a little bit, because Joseph Mengele, the Nazi monster. The angel Leo Stanley is Leo Stanley is no better. Right. He's an inspiration. So he is an, a direct inspiration. And Mengele himself also says, look what California did. I looked at it and I drew on that. So Leo Stanley um, was at San Quentin Penitentiary. And he wanted to figure out a way to eliminate the unfit from society. And I have to give you a little trigger warning here. This is going to get kind of graphic and gruesome. So what he does is he starts per- performing testicular surgery on inmates. And he takes testicles. This is how weird this is. He takes testicles from deceased people who were viewed as fit members of society and transplants them into the bodies of these criminals who he views as unfit. And the rationale is, So this criminal can't control himself and is going to continue to have sex. At least the sex he's going to be having and the sperm he's going to be passing on is going to be the sperm of a fit person. And uh, these obviously are not, these don't work at all. And then he starts to resort to implanting animal testicles into these men. None of I mean, this is he, consensual, by the way. You, no, you cannot at all. consent to medical Although testing. Although what he's doing is convincing these, these inmates that their sex life will be better when they get out of prison if they undergo this surgery. And so he ends up um, sterilizing quite a few men during it. Um, and it's just, this is just kind of the grossest example of what, California's 1909 law basically opens the door for in these institutions. And it's, and it's not isolated. There are parallel things going on in many other places. And here's the thing, and and I want to talk about a Supreme court case in a minute, but here's the thing. Even today, there is not explicitly a law banning eugenics practices. 
Well, and as we talked about earlier, we still participate in these practices as being prenatal health. Um, I mean, it, it just, it boggles my mind. So I know you know a lot about African-American women in California penitentiaries at this time. Well, so what's interesting about California is when they passed this law in 1909 about, they, they call it asexualization, but it's sterilizing, right? Um, when they passed this law in 1909 through the state Senate, it was signed into law and there was only one dissenting vote. Only one person said, eh, I don't think so. So you have this overwhelming support for it. And it's the the law is amended a couple of times, once in 1913 and once in 1917, but it's amended to say, we're going to move out of the prisons. I mean, we're still going to sterilize people in prison, but we want to actually expand this program to go into what at the time was called insane asylums. So like mental health facilities. And so they're able to just institutionalize whoever they want, basically, under the guise of like, oh, this is for your mental health, or you've been some sort of a menace to society because you committed a, a crime. Um, and you start having these eugenics, what they're calling asexualization um, programs taking place in these different institutions. And so not only is it state sanctioned, not only does, you know, the entire state um, government body agree to it except for one person, but it's a robust enterprise. You have, I would say, I would say it indelibly influences American culture ever since too. Yeah. What California is doing. With your, it's normal, but it's normalizing it too. It's doing, first of all, it is, there is a profound distrust within many communities of color in California of the state. And once you study this, you understand exactly where this comes from. And this is not the first, nor is it the last example of the state kind of abusing its relationship with people of color. But you have that, but at the same time, it normalizes all these crazy ideas. So many prominent Californians are advocates of, of eugenicists practices as well. The founder of Stanford, the first chair of the trustee board of the California State University System. The IQ test is invented in California, and it's very clearly invented for eugenicist reasons. Becomes it, it becomes an empirical metric for if you score below this number, you should be forcibly sterilized if given the opportunity. So what happens in California specifically, though, is that you have forced sterilization of Mexican-American migrant workers. Um, they also fall under the category of people who are going to be sterilized um, under these new laws passed in 1909 um, because there are a lot of migrant workers who are coming. And, and, you know, to say across the border at this time, like there's no really such thing as a border. I mean, it's like rudimentary that it starts to. Uh, California. Yeah, California agriculture was wholly dependent on seasonal labor. Right. Uh, seasonal laborers coming north, working, and the way it worked is they would kind of work their way up the agricultural regions of California as each kind of season, e each kind of different form of produce a season came in, they would kind of work their way north. Um, but it's very indicative that even before kind of border control becomes an obsession, there's this very contentious relationship between the state and these immigrants. Well, there's the labor. idea that there's the labor is needed, but then these populations of migrant workers are targeted for Americanization programs, which are heavily related to eugenics of like, well, we're going to teach you how to be a proper American. We're going to teach you English. We're going to teach you hygiene. We're going to teach you um, our social structure. Um, and, you know, a lot of times the women and children who were brought into these Americanization programs um, who were migrant workers, a lot of these women would be sterilized. If they had more than, you know, two, three children or something like that, it could be very a subjective case-by-case -case basis. But many of these women were forcibly sterilized through tubal ligations. Um, field workers used to be pulled out of the field in the middle of the day 
kind of inexplicably, and they would be sterilized under these laws in California. And it was aiming to cure, um, so to speak, what the eugenicists would say is like, there are too many people who are, you know, reproducing, um, who are not fit, quote unquote, to reproduce. And so Mexican American migrant workers become a heavy target of this program, particularly in California. And so again, you still have this huge distrust. And Again, I see it as related very much to the crisis at the border today um, and what ICE has been accused of doing to detainees. But the idea that you could, you know, perform a vasectomy on a man or a tubal ligation on a woman without their informed consent is it's mind boggling, isn't it? Yeah. But I mean, what are they so what are they doing to African-American women in the penitentiary system? Well, African-American women for centuries have been used as, as like guinea pigs, lab rats, right? I mean, we talked about a prominent victim of this last week, right? Right. Or, we talked about Henrietta yeah, Lacks. That's right. Henrietta Lacks. Yeah. So black women for centuries had been used in medical practice um, to be practiced on. And the field of gynecology um, and ops obstetrics comes out of the, the slave era, the slavery era, where you would have people coming in and trying to figure out, you know, what's going on with women's reproductive health, with slaves' reproductive health, and incredibly invasive, non-voluntary procedures would take place against Black women who were enslaved, and then later Black women who were incarcerated. And we, of course, know that there's heavy relationship between slavery and incarceration in this country. But more times, you know, more often than not, these women are being used as lab rats to test out um, eugenics policies or ideas or sterilization procedures or gynecological procedures. Um, I mean, you have doctors perfecting tubal ligation via repeated experiments on black women incarcerated in California. Yes. And we have this data. We, we have the data. You can go look at this thing. I mean, this is, and my students are always perplexed by this. They're like, why did somebody keep a record of this? This is such a smoking gun. And it's like, you don't understand. They thought what they were doing would be celebrated by society. Well, they thought what they were doing was science science. And so you, you scolded me for saying pseudoscience earlier, but they thought that they were objectively studying the body. But they right? also thought they were making the world a better place. Right, right. They th well, they thought by sterilizing people who they were who subjectively were considered unfit was going to improve humanity. Mm -hmm. And what I find interesting is is so you get a couple of high profile Supreme, not so one is a Supreme court case. The other is a California Supreme court case. And I want to talk about the California case first. So Madrigal, Madrigal versus uh, Quilligan. And this is in 1973. So this is, this is not ancient history, right? This is the relatively recent past. Um, you had a woman who was at uh, the university of Southern California medical center She's there to give birth to a child. Um, she only has one other child, which I think is a very interesting thing to note. Um, and while she's in labor, the doctors get her to sign this form that basically says as part of delivering the baby, they're going to form a tubal ligation on her. And later on, uh, three years later, it turns out the University of Southern California Medical Center was doing was targeting Hispanic women that they would try to coerce Hispanic women into getting these tubal ligations and they would either say it and not fully explain what that meant or they would kind of uh, connect the welfare of the child with this procedure lots of sketchy stuff so they end up suing and During the suit, the, the, the testimony um, – 
James Quilligan, who's kind of the defendant, named as the defendant because he's the lead OBGYN, um, he actually is quoted as saying, poor minority women in L.A. County were having too many babies. This was a strain on society and that it was good that they be sterilized. The same thing happens to Native American women Mm -hmm. in the 1970s. You have tens of thousands of women who are forcibly sterilized. And the idea is like, well, we did everybody a favor here. We did them a favor and we did society a favor. And it's so, not hidden. I like that you mentioned that, that, you know, it's right there in the records because they don't think that they're, that, that it's like a malfeasance, right? Right. And then, so the California Supreme Court rules in the favor of the defendants and says, look, you, you know, uh, recommending a tubal ligation is good. That's that's actually an appropriate thing for an OBGYN to recommend to help diminish overpopulation. The presiding judge is using the word. I mean, everybody seems okay with this. And there's no Supreme Court ruling that stops this. Now, many states remove their eugenicist laws but there's nothing preventing a state today from having one. And I want to go back now to one of the most famous quotes related to eugenesis practices and the Supreme Court. And this comes out of the case of Buck v. Bell. <clears throat> so this is Oliver Wendell Holmes says this. And I, Oliver Wendell Holmes said just some great, great things in his uh, either his uh, majority opinions or his uh, dissenting opinions he issued while he was on the Supreme Court. But so he says things like, if there's any principle of the Constitution that more imperatively calls for attachment than any other, it is the principle of free thought, not free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for those freedom for the thought that we hate. That's United States versus Schwimmer. Uh, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. Schenck versus the United States. Some of the most well-worded decisions ever rendered. We have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. It would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sapped the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices often not felt to be such by those concerned in order to prevent our world our being swamped with incompetence. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Jason, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, 197 U.S. 11. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. That's the quote that I knew. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. And it's amazing that he connects it to vaccination. Yeah. As if it's just a public health. It's, it's just a matter of public health. And I love that you talked about that in the very beginning. Like, what is the government's role in protecting people? It just... It, it is so uh, – Buck versus Bell is based on a Virginia law that allowed sterilization, and there's some amazing testimony that comes out of it. And it's basically you have people trying to kind of prove that Carrie Buck is to use their word an imbecile and is undeserving of the privilege to reproduce – I mean, that's kind of how they're presenting it is the state's decided, the state gets to decide who gets to reproduce. Um, and, I, you know, go investigate. There's been some fascinating things written on this, but there's just such a disturbing use of, of kind of what we would call pseudoscience today. Because they're like using all these empirical ways to determine how unintelligent she is, how incapable she is of managing her own affairs. Um, but it's, yeah, it's it's just mind boggling. I mean, the state still plays a major role in deciding who is and who isn't a fit parent, right? And I mean, we talked we've talked a lot about this several times in many in, in episodes, right? Of like. 
we like to protect children as a society. And we go to like these extreme lengths to protect children. Um, usually relying on class and race. Um, but this is just another means of doing it. And because the science is available at this time, because of the advances in the gynecological profession, which did not exist until into the 19th century, really. But because of advances in it, they're like, well, we've controlled everything else. Let's start to control this aspect to make society better. And it's so disturbing. And to me, I was talking to students about this today. We talked about Margaret Sanger in class today. And they were totally blown away by all of this. But one of the things that I would like to throw out there is just in the last decade, in the last 10 years, birth control has been free. Right? It mm -hmm. is free to access birth control. Anybody can go get it. And you don't even need your parents around to do it anymore. You can just go get birth control. How much is it for in vitro fertilization? It's $20,000 a round. Right. And I, and, and I think that you have to think about it in that way. It's like we are really interested. Like going back to what we were talking about in the very beginning about the difference between the British model of eugenics and the United States' model. It's like we are really interested in stopping people from reproducing. But then having like this gatekeeping mechanism for people to reproduce and it's so reliant on wealth – and it, that translates in this society to race. Mm -hmm. Is that too far fetched? No, I think it's I think it's a good point. And I want to before we kind of make this episode too terribly long, I want to bring up fi one final thing for us to discuss. And this is a more recent development, and this gets into philosophy, which is not necessarily a place historians. I don't say like to go, but it can present problems. So what do you think about the argument now that we actually have two forms of eugenics going on? We have a liberal eugenics versus authoritative eugenics. And liberal eugenics incorporate things like individual free choice, pluralist values, uh, contemporary understandings of genetics and epigenetics. Um, and that advocates of this liberal eugenics are sensitive to things like racism and sexism and heterosexism. Whereas authoritative eugenics are coercive state programs promoting social goods and it's based around hereditability of undesirable characteristics. I mean, what do you think about that? Is this whole – is labeling part of it liberal and saying, well, it takes into account all these things and it's very sensitive, does that make it okay? No, I don't. I think that it's it's just eugenics across the board and I think that it can take – a lot of different routes. And I think that some of it can be well-intentioned and I'll bring back IVF into that. I think that people who undergo IVF are well-intentioned and I think that they want to have a baby. And I think that the science behind it says, Hey, we've developed all this stuff. Let's make a baby. But there are teams of people who determine which embryo is most fit Right. They do genetic testing on it. They they examine well, it through, you know. Their well, and couples do that too. Couples where you have um, either one or both partners are are sterile. Um, they'll basically look at catalogs of where the eggs are coming from and where yeah. the sperm's coming from. Yeah. And they get pick to for certain things. And we actually know with things like CRISPR and other genetic sequencing techniques now – you're going to be able to like custom engineer your baby. Well, and you can't, I mean, you can find people like sperm donors and stuff, right? Like, Oh, I want somebody who's six feet tall. I want somebody who has blonde hair or blue eyes. Like, Holy crap. That sounds like Nazi Germany, but you mm -hmm. can do that now. And, and I'm not at all at all trying to debase or, anything, people who are trying to have a baby. I think that we have amazing advancements in technology and science. And like, I think it is beautiful, whatever way that somebody can go about having their child. I think it's great. I do think that there's a slippery slope when it comes to this genetic testing. And when it comes to determining viability, when it comes to determining which embryo they're going to implant, etc. I think that based on our very fraught history 
in this country. It can get scary really quickly when you start to have these very subjective measures about what is or is not viable or fit or unfit. And even people who reproduce, um, I don't know if this is a controversial way to say it, but even people who reproduce naturally, I mean, you do go in for genetic testing and try to make decisions about whether you're going to bring a child into the world who may have, you know, trisomy 21, or there's any number of genetic tests that they do well, right? they, very early. Right. And they'll also, they can also, even before that, they can tell you, look, the two of you, the odds of you having a child that has this is pretty high. That's eugenics. Making a decision of whether or not to go ahead and get pregnant and have that child, that is eugenics. You are making a conscientious decision or conscious decision, maybe not conscientious, a conscious decision about what genetic material you want to be propagated and what you don't want to be propagated. And it's, it's very messy and it's, I, it should make you uncomfortable. I think. I think it if you're not in a, a lot of questions about what we value or don't value in humans. Yeah. And I hate to, to put it this way, but I mean, we do it all the time with animals we breed I mean, animals this is for particular traits. This is the thing. I could easily see a couple in a place like La Jolla going to get in vitro fertilization. And they're like, we want to have two children. We want the boy to be over six foot two. Um, we want the girl to have these features. We'd like both of them to have high IQs. We want both of them to go to Stanford. Oh, the high IQ thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can we get want both of them to go to Stanford. Like, yeah. They went to an Ivy League or something like that. I mean, it's yeah. really creepy. We, I mean, you want to talk about privilege? I mean, we've, I think we're on the cusp of this genetic privilege thing where now parents can custom engineer their children. But see, it's a genetic privilege that's tied to privilege, privilege, right? Of like, what? Right. It's tied. To, it's tied to other forms of privilege. There's but an it's, economic it's barrier like, to people. But I think it's the ultimate form because now you're you are not 100 percent guaranteeing these things, but you are really tipping the scales about the success of your children. And again, it's. The history, particularly that communities of color in California in particular, have with local medical institutions and the state, particularly the state health department, I think this is bearing itself out right now with the vaccination program. Um, Although more and more people within the uh, communities of color are now saying they're willing to get the vaccination, I can completely understand by somebody might be reticent to participate in the state program based on what the state's done before. Um, it's like, well, I know they've done this. I mean, 1973, 10 Hispanic women sued and lost because evidently OBGYNs can do whatever they want if they think it's the best interest of society. Yeah. I mean, it happened in 2001 um, as well. There's a documentary that I have not seen, but I came across it when I was, um, researching for today and it's called belly of the beast and it exposes state sanctioned sterilizations in California prisons through the story of Kelly Dillon, who was forcibly sterilized while incarcerated um, at the central California women's facility in Chowchilla. And this happened in 2001. And, and no, so this is an ongoing issue. Right. Because there has never been a Supreme court decision that is unequivocally said you cannot do this how insane is that right like that there's not that we have not as a society agreed like hey let's don't do because that because i think we're okay with it on a level i do I too think as a society i think we're very comfortable with it mm-hmm. we don't like it thrown in our face and we don't want it done to us okay as individuals but we think right. more broadly gosh yeah <laughs> Wow. This, sorry this to end on a, to about, right? Sorry to end on a downer. Wow. I mean, we knew this was going to be rough though. Like, I mean, I think the takeaway is this Margaret Sanger does some amazing stuff uh, with putting the ability of women to control their own kind of sexual lives. Um, at the same time, she's involved in some really horrible things. Um, and she's an advocate for it. Right, she's an advocate for the state intervening and keeping undesirables from 
from reproducing. Um, yeah. Yikes. <laughs> Any last words? Um, no, I think that there's a lot to consider and to keep thinking about. And if you have any questions or if you want us to explore any of these topics further, please pop a comment um, into our Instagram or down into YouTube or um, wherever. If you know us personally, text us, call us, something like that. Um, we really love exploring these issues and it certainly gives us a lot to think about. Um, so we'll probably revisit some part portions of this at some point. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, I'm Hillary. And I'm Jeff. Until next time. Mm -hmm.